morning or good afternoon or good evening uh, to everyone wherever you happen to be watching from. It's, it's lovely to be with you and to be sharing in this uh, wonderful event of the Carl Henry uh, Institute. So uh, come and please with me and take a look at three great truths from the Bible about creation. First of all, at the goodness of creation as we look back to its original beginning. And then the glory of creation as we look around at the way in which it functions in bringing praise and glory to its creator today. And then also thirdly to look at the goal of creation as we look forward to God's ultimate purpose for the whole creation in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. So first of all then, the goodness of creation. As Jeff has already prayed, creation is good. That is the unmistakable message of the opening chapter of the Bible. Six times God declares that what he has just done is good, and then the seventh time, very good. And we can think of this goodness of creation at least two ways, I think. It's good in relation to God, and it is good in relation to ourselves. So first of all then, creation is good in relation to God. And here I think there are four ways in which that is true. First of all, that the good creation reveals the good God. In other ancient Near Eastern cosmologies, creation was often the work of multiple deities, usually in varying degrees of conflict and malevolence and battle. Whereas by contrast, in the Old Testament, creation is the work of one single living God, and it therefore bears witness to that one God's existence and power and character. Creation reveals its creator, although of course he is not himself part of it. Here are some examples of this point being made. Perhaps the most familiar is Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. But also Psalm 50, verse 6, the righteousness of God. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, for he is a God of justice. Psalm 65, verse 9, speaks of the care of God. You care for the land and water it. Psalm 104 speaks of the provision of God. All creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. And then coming to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul shows how creation reveals the kindness of God when he says to them, he has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons and provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. And then of course, his very familiar statement in Romans 1 verse 20 about the power of God since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So creation reveals its creator. A second way in which creation is good in relation to God is that creation has intrinsic value to God and value that it receives from God. That repeated affirmation that God saw that it was good is made quite independently of us, us human beings. In fact, it's made prior to our existence. The goodness of creation is not our response to the beauty or the benefits of creation, although of course it certainly should be that, now that we are actually here. Rather, Genesis 1 shows that it is God's evaluation of God's own handiwork. It's the seal of God's approval on the whole universe and all its functioning. So creation has intrinsic value because it is valued by God, who is the source of all value. So to speak of the goodness of creation is not then, first of all, to say that it's valuable to us, which of course it is, but to say that it is valued by God and was created fit for purpose, that is, for God's purpose. As an illustration of this point, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that Psalm 104, that great psalm of creation celebrates not only those aspects which serve human needs like crops and domestic animals but also those that have no immediate connection with human life at least from the perspective of the ancient world the wild places of the earth high trees mountains and the wild creatures that live there they are also noticed and celebrated and valued simply by being and doing what god created them to be and do so then thirdly, creation is good in relation to God because creation is God's property. The earth is the Lord's, says Psalm 24, verse 1. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14. Now, these are quite staggering universal affirmations that 
we easily just slip past. You know, the earth is the Lord's, yes, yeah, so what's next? But they are stating that the whole universe, including, of course, planet Earth, is simply God's property. It all belongs to him. So the earth is first and foremost owned by God, not by us. God is the supreme landlord. We are tenants. We are guests living by God's permission and God's property. Or as I read once in a little notice on the, in the bathroom of a hotel room, it was a Marriott hotel, and the, the notice said, we are all guests on this planet. It just didn't specify whose guests we actually are. So what this generates, of course, then, are some huge ethical implications that can't all be explored here at this point. But at the very least, it reminds us that we are accountable to God for how we treat his property, the earth. Now, Jeff mentioned the, the Cape Town commitment, and I, I don't know if you know it. It's, the, it's this document here, the statement of that third Lausanne Congress on world evangelization in 2010. And it states this accountability, human accountability for creation as being, and I quote, the logical outworking of our love for God by caring for what belongs to him. The earth is the property of the God we claim to love and obey. So we care for the earth, most simply, because it belongs to the one whom we call Lord, end of quote. And then fourthly, creation is good in relation to God because creation is God's temple. Now it's increasingly being recognized that in the thought of the ancient world generally, and in Old Testament Israel specifically, temples were envisaged as, quite literally, microcosms. That is, they were small representations on earth of the shape and order of the whole universe, the cosmos itself. And meanwhile, the other way around, the cosmos as a whole could be seen as a macro temple, that is the dwelling place of the gods, or of course in Old Testament terms, of the one true living creator God himself. And from this perspective then, God's declaration that his work of creation was good is a way of saying that he saw and approved the whole of creation functioning in all its ordered complexity, both as the place prepared for him to install his image, namely the human race, and also as the place for his own dwelling. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool, as he says in Isaiah 66, and that's very strongly temple image. So then, the Bible as a whole speaks of the natural world in relation to God. The created order obeys God, reveals God's glory, benefits from God's provision, serves God's purposes in judgment or in salvation, and is filled with God's presence. So we honor creation as sacred in that sense, not of course as divine in itself, not as something we worship, because that is explicitly for, for, forbidden in the Old Testament, but simply because of its God-relatedness. Creation is good in relation to the good God who created it. And so our actions within creation reflect our response to the creator God. And so that brings us then to the other side of this goodness of creation, our first major section, which is that creation is good in relation to us, that is, as human beings. The final climactic statement that God saw all that he had made and it was very good comes immediately after the climax of the creation sequence in Genesis 1 with the arrival of the human race made in the image of God. So the goodness of creation is obviously intimately bound up with our existence and role within it. Now, we've already seen that it's God's earth because he made it, but it is also our earth. Psalm 115 verse 16 puts it like this, that the highest heavens belong to God, but the earth he has given to the children of Adam, the sons of man, the human race. So the earth then is the place of human habitation. It is God's property, but it's also our responsibility. The earth is in some sense given to human beings in a way that it wasn't stated to be given to the other animals. Now, at one level, of course, we are, aren't we? We are animals among the animals. We are creatures among the creatures. So in what sense are we different? What makes the human species special or unique? 
Well, at first sight, the Bible stresses much more about what we have in common with the rest of the animals created by God than anything immediately that is different from them. We are told to be blessed and to multiply. Well, so were they, and in fact, before we were. We were created on the sixth day, but we didn't get that whole day to ourselves. It was only, as it were, along with and after the other wild and domestic animals and even the creepy crawlies. We were created from the ground as they were, or rather, in fact, from the dust of the ground, which, as one commentator puts it, hardly marks us out as superior. And we are given the breath of life. But then so were all the living creatures that breathe, even before the creation of humanity and afterwards in the story of the flood. God provides us with food, but so did he for the others. So it's simply a matter of wonder and, and, and rejoicing that we share with all the other animals in the love and the care and the provision of our creator God. We are creatures of the creator, and that's wonderful. So to acknowledge that we are creatures like the rest of the animals is not demeaning to our humanity, rather it celebrates the incredible capacity and power of God who brought this whole magnificent biosphere into existence, including us. So what then does make us different? Well, two things are affirmed in Genesis. First, that we were created in the image of God in order to be equipped to exercise dominion within creation in Genesis 1. And secondly, that we were placed in the earth, initially in the Garden of Eden, of course, in order to serve and care for it in Genesis 2. So first of all, then, we were created to rule, as it were, kings in the image of God. God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, the wild animals, and so on. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over all the rest of those creatures. Now, the grammar of those familiar verses there in Genesis 1 implies that God created human beings with the intention that they should indeed exercise rule over the rest of the animal creation, and that he created us in the image of God in order to equip us for that function. So these two things, image of God and dominion over creation, they're not identical with each other, but they are very closely related in the sense that the one enables and equips for the other. So we were created then to exercise the delegated kingship of God within creation. Just as in that ancient world, emperors would often set up statues or images of themselves in the countries that they ruled over in order to indicate their authority within those realms. And so human beings as the image of God represent the authority of the real king, the creator. But here's the thing, how does God exercise his kingship within creation? Well, the Psalms tell us. Psalm 104 shows that God cares and provides for all his creatures, wild and domestic and human. And Psalm 145, which actually addresses God as my God, the King, tells us that God exercises his kingship by being gracious, good, faithful, generous, protective, just, and loving, towards all that he has made. All those words occur in the psalm. That's how God exercises his kingship over creation. And therefore, if human beings are the image of God, this God of justice and compassion, then human rule within creation was never meant to be a license to dominate or crush or waste or destroy. You know, that's tyranny, modeled on fallen human sinfulness and arrogance, not kingship modeled on God's character and behavior. There's an interesting example of this model of kingship in 1 Kings chapter 12 verse 7 when you remember the elders of Judah came to King Rehoboam after the death of Solomon and asked him to lighten their load and the elders of Judah advised Rehoboam in this way they said if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, then they will always be your servants. Mutual servanthood, that was the ideal. 
the people would serve the king, yes, provided the king would serve them without injustice. And likewise, the earth will serve our needs, yes, provided we exercise our kingship as God's image in God's way by serving and caring for it. So that leads us then naturally on to the second dimension of our distinctive human role. Not only are we created to rule as kings in the image of God, but secondly also we are located to serve in Genesis 2 verse 15, where we read that God took the man that he had created and put him in the garden literally to serve and keep it. So what we see here in this complementary text is that human rule within creation, Genesis 1, is to be exercised by human servanthood for creation in Genesis 2. This pattern of servant kingship is very clear. And of course, it was modeled perfectly by Jesus himself, the perfect human being, the perfect image of God. When he quite deliberately demonstrated his status as Lord and Master by washing the disciples' feet, kingship exercised through servanthood. That is God's intention for humanity, modelled by his own incarnate son. But this language of serving and keeping has another resonance, because it's very strongly the language of priesthood. Repeatedly in the book of Leviticus, it is said that the task of the priests and the Levites was to serve God in the tabernacle, and later, of course, in the temple, and to keep all that God had entrusted to them there. So we have then a priestly role as well as a kingly role within creation, which is actually very significant language in, in view of how God was later going to describe the role of Israel among the nations in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, as a kingdom of priests. And later, how the book of Revelation will describe the role of redeemed humanity within the new creation, where it says, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. So then the language of God placing his image within creation has temple overtones as well. For that's where the images of the gods were indeed placed in their temples. So with the cosmos functioning as the macro temple of the creator God, God places his own image the living human being in his temple to dwell with him there. Creation functions as the dwelling place of God and human beings function as the image of God, ruling and serving creation on his behalf. So summarizing this whole first section then, we can say that the goodness of creation is a way of affirming that it is God's earth and it is our earth. And in both senses, it is good. And so we move on then, secondly, to our second main section, the glory of creation. And once again, this falls into two parts. God's glory is expressed first through the praise of creation, and also secondly, God's glory is seen in the fullness of creation. First of all then, God's glory expressed through the praise of creation. Now, when I was a child growing up in a Presbyterian church in Belfast in Northern Ireland, we had to learn the shorter catechism of the Westminster Confession of Faith. And the first question we were drilled to answer was, what is the chief end of man? In other words, what is the purpose, the ultimate purpose of human existence? Although you can imagine the fun that little boys had with the whole idea of the chief end of man, man's chief end. But the answer to that question was, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And I believe that the same question and the same answer could be applied to creation as a whole. Creation exists for the praise and glory of God, for God's enjoyment of his creation and its enjoyment of him. So the ultimate purpose of human life, man's chief end, to glorify God and enjoy him, is not something that distinguishes us from the rest of creation, but rather something that we share in common with the rest of creation. Now, of course, we must immediately agree that we as human beings glorify God in uniquely human ways, 
with our rationality, our language, our emotions, our poetry, our music, our art, hearts and hands and minds and voices in our choicest psalmody, as one of our older hymns says. Yes, we know what it is for us to praise and glorify God. But the Bible affirms that all creation already praises God and can be summoned repeatedly to do so. So the Psalms are full of it. Psalm 145, all your works praise you, Lord, and your faithful people extol you. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord and let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Or Psalms 148 and 150, praise the Lord from the earth, great sea creatures, ocean depths, lightning, hail, snow, mountains, hills, trees, cedars, wild animals, cattle, kings of the earth, all nations, let them all praise the name of the Lord, for his name is exalted, Psalm 148. And there are hints, of course, that God himself takes delight and joy in his creation. It's not just that it praises him, but he enjoys it. In that great psalm of creation, uh, Psalm 104, it not only celebrates the existence of the great sea creatures, nicknamed Leviathan, but it may actually portray God himself playing with them in the ocean. Here's how it reads in our uh, NIV. We read, there is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and leviathan which you formed to frolic there verse 25 26 and that last verse that last verb of the verse can very legitimately be translated whom you formed to play with as the esv actually offers as an alternative translation so you see what may be happening here is that the poetic imagination that can picture yahweh in all kinds of moods and actions within his creation anyway invites us here to see him joyfully splashing around in the ocean with the whales. And <laughs> why not? I love that picture. And after all, the Psalms can also picture trees singing and rivers clapping their hands and the whole creation, heaven, earth, seas, all rejoicing with jubilant songs of joy. Why? Well, because as Psalm 96 and Psalm 98 put it, that all creation rejoice before the Lord for he comes. And why is he coming? He comes to judge the earth and he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. And that is, of course, meaning that he will put all things right within creation, because that's what judging means in Old Testament terms. And that then becomes the eschatological climax of the whole Bible story, a climax that quite explicitly in the book of Revelation includes the non-human creation, as well as the redeemed from every human tribe and nation and language, of all the countless hosts of angels. John's vision in Revelation 5 reaches its fullest crescendo of praise when he says, then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits in the throne and to the Lamb be praise and glory and honor and power forever and ever. Now, we may not be able to grasp or explain how creation praises God, or how God receives the praise of his non-human creatures. But I think that creatures praise and glorify God simply by being and doing what they were created for, and that God is pleased and glorified when they do. The non-human creation brings glory to God simply by existing, for it exists only by God's sustaining and renewing power, and therefore bears witness to God's greatness. So just because we can't understand how creation praises and glorifies God, we should not deny what the Bible regularly affirms, namely that it does. The glory of creation is that in some way it embodies and expresses the glory of God. And that leads us then to our second point in this section, that not only is God's glory enhanced by the praise of creation, but also God's glory is seen in the fullness of creation. The glory of God is sometimes linked to the fullness of the earth, or literally in Hebrew, the filling of the earth, which means this rich abundance of biodiversity itself, which is celebrated in Genesis 1, 
as creation moves from formless and empty through to ordered and full. And again, the Psalms give us a number of examples of this fullness. Some of our modern translations translate that word as everything in it, but I much prefer the old version, the fullness thereof, Psalm 24 verse 1, or Psalm 50 verse 12, to me, says God, belongs the world and its fullness. After listing a load of animals, so the forest, cattle, birds, insects, and so on. Psalm 104, verse 31, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in all his works. And it's clear that this psalm, with all that it talks of the diversity of creatures, is putting into parallelism here the glory of God and all the works of God, expressing the fullness of creation. And I think that this may well give an interesting perspective on the cry of the seraphim, you remember, in Isaiah's vision of the glory of God in the temple, in Isaiah chapter 6. What they cry out literally is, Holy, 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 Yahweh Sebaoth, the fullness or filling of all the earth, his glory. Now, that's usually translated, the whole earth is full of his glory. And that's true, of course. But reading the sentence in English in that way can marginalize the word full, as if the earth was just a kind of receptacle that has got filled up with glory. But the word fullness or filling stands emphatically first in the Hebrew sentence as a noun. And that fullness of the earth, as we've seen in several Psalms, is a shorthand expression for the abundance of life on earth in all its wonderful forms. Accordingly, it would be perfectly possible to translate the words as the abundance and diversity of life that fills the whole earth constitutes the glory of God. That is to say, the glory of God is rendered to us through the abundance of God's own creation. Now, of course, we would need to be careful at that point and not read some kind of pantheism into such a statement as if there were nothing more to the glory of God than the glory and sum of creation itself. No, no, God's glory transcends creation. The Psalms also say, you have set your glory above the heavens. And the, the several Psalms express that same truth. But even having acknowledged that, I think we can certainly affirm that the glory of God is mediated to us through creation, not only in the awesome majesty of the heavens, as Psalm 19 puts it, but also through the abundance of life on earth. We live in a glory-filled earth, which is one reason, of course, why the Apostle Paul says that we are without excuse when we fail to glorify God and give thanks to him in Romans 1, verses 20 and 21. There's a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 14, verse 31, which says, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. The principle obviously is that since human beings are made in God's image, whatever we do to other people, in some sense we are doing to God. And as we well know, Jesus extended that principle in relation to himself in Matthew 25. And I would want to argue that it's a legitimate ext extension of that same principle to conclude that since the fullness of created life on earth in some sense constitutes God's glory, or at least constitutes one of the ways in which we experience God's glory, then whatever fulfills Genesis 1 and 2 by developing and enhancing and properly using the resources of the earth, while at the same time serving and caring for it, acknowledges and contributes to the glory of God. But Conversely, whatever needlessly destroys, degrades, pollutes, wastes life on earth, diminishes God's glory. That seems to be to be one part of what is at stake from a biblical Christian point of view in the attitudes and positions and actions that we take in this current ecological crisis and debate. How we treat the earth reflects how we are treating its creator and ours. And so finally then, let's turn to our third section where we move from the goodness and the glory of creation to the goal 
of creation. So at this point, we're no longer just looking back to the original creation in Genesis and our role within it, nor are we just looking around at the glory of God expressed in the praise of creation, the fullness of the earth. No, now we're looking forward to God's ultimate purpose for creation. And that's a very encouraging place to look. Because first of all, the Bible teaches us that creation is included in the scope of God's redemptive purpose. Uh, actually, the first thing we need to say is that creation needs redemption. And from the very beginning of the Bible, it's made clear to us that sin and evil have affected the natural order as well as human, moral, and spiritual life. Cursed is the earth because of you, said God to Adam. Now, I think that the primary focus of that statement is on the earth as the Adama, which means the ground of the soil, rather than Eretz, which is the whole world in a sense. In other words, it's talking about the ground, the earth, in relation to human life and work, the place where we live and work rather, I think, than on what we might think of as the geological structures and functioning of the planet as a whole. That is, I do not personally believe that we should attribute all natural phenomena that are potentially destructive or in some sense nasty or dangerous to us, such as the shifting of the tectonic plates and earthquakes and tsunamis, volcanoes, and so on, to the curse of God. Those geological realities are simply part of the way that God has made life on earth possible at all. Because without the shifting of tectonic plates, there would be no mountains, no rivers, no soil, no climatic variation or pre precipitation, and many others of the features of the planet earth that we live on that make it fit for organic life and ultimately for human habitation. Nevertheless, of course, the Apostle Paul does make clear in agreement with Genesis 3, this very strong theological affirmation that the whole creation is in some sense frustrated, subjected to futility in some sense, including what he calls decay and bondage, and that it will remain so until it is liberated by God and, quote, brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God in Romans 8, verses 19 to 21. And that is the future that God has for his whole creation. So you see, the truth is then that just as creation shares in the effects of our sin, so we will share in the fullness of creation's redemption. Creation suffers with us and because of us, but we will rejoice with creation when God liberates it along with us from all the suffering and death that is in the world for in the present time. For God's ultimate purpose, again, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, is to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ, which is one of the most astonishingly universal and cosmic affirmations in the whole Bible. All things in heaven and earth being brought into unity under Christ. So you see, we are not going to be saved out of the earth. We are going to be saved along with the earth. But where did the Apostle Paul get such an idea from? Well, of course, clearly from the scriptures, from his scriptures, from what we now call the Old Testament, because the prophets certainly included creation in their understanding of salvation, or as we might say, they included ecology in their eschatology. We know that familiar passage in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 to 9, where the whole messianic era will include environmental harmony. The wolf will live with the lamb, the calf and the lion lying down together, a little child will feed them, and so it goes on. Uh, they will neither harm nor destroy in all my holy mountain, and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the, of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There's a creational dimension to what God is going to do through his servant, through the Messiah. Or there's Isaiah 35, which speaks of the restoration of God's people, heralding creational abundance. And even more so, Isaiah 65, verses 17 to 25, where we read about the new heavens and the new earth, 
a very explicit prophetic word in which God affirms that he is already creating. The verb is participial. He says, I am creating new heavens and a new earth. And then the picture that follows from that in Isaiah 65 depicts life on earth that is full of joy, free from tears, life fulfilling, family building, with deep satisfaction and fruitfulness in ordinary labor, free from the curse of frustration and injustice, and with environmental peace and harmony in the natural world. It's a glorious picture there that provides so much of the imagery and vocabulary for Revelation 21 and 22. And then, of course, as we've already seen in Psalm 96, there's the rejoicing of all creation. Those Psalms 96, 98, with their picture of the whole of creation bursting forth in jubilant joy because God is coming to put things right. Old Testament stuff. Now, at that point, we shouldn't kind of smile rather dismissively at all of this as if it were, well, that's just a case of Old Testament earthiness, you know, some kind of primitive earthbound materialism that then gets transcended by the more spiritual message of the New Testament. Not at all. That kind of platonic dualism simply won't do, either in the Old Testament or in the New. Remember, it's the Apostle Paul who speaks about a liberated creation being brought to birth within the womb of this creation, whose groanings, he says, are the labor pains of creation's future as well as our own. That's his wonderfully suggestive portrayal of childbirth there in Romans 8, verses 18 to 25. And we, we who await the redemption of our bodies, as he puts it in verse 23, will inhabit that new creation in our resurrection bodies, modeled on the prototype resurrection body of Jesus, who, again, quoting Paul, says that by the power enabled that, that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. And that, of course, that's one reason why the bodily resurrection of Jesus is so vitally important. I mean, the disciples in Luke, they thought the risen Jesus was a ghost, you remember? But he deliberately demonstrated to his disciples that he was fully physical, more than physical, with body parts, flesh and bones, the ability to be touched, and to eat food, and later on to light a fire and make breakfast. So you see, the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead is God's yes to the whole physical created order. And the risen Jesus is the firstborn of the new creation. And we shall be like him, says John, for we shall see him as he is, and we'll be in a fully and bodily form in a restored creation. Now, at this point, we do need to address a question. What is meant by that language of fiery destruction and dissolution that we find in some descriptions of the end of the world, as we might call it, though that's not a very good expression? So we need to see then, as our second point here, that this is the language of purging and not obliteration. See, some people struggle with the whole idea, this whole idea of the redemption of creation, because they believe that the future of the universe is total obliteration in some great cosmic conflagration. Now, that view may sometimes be linked to a very unbiblical platonic dualism, as I mentioned earlier, in which matter itself is seen as inferior and tainted and sinful and temporary, whereas only the spiritual realm is pure and eternal. And so they can only envisage a future in terms of some ultimate release from the shackles and prison of physicality here on earth into the enjoyment of some spiritual heaven with God. And that's not, decidedly not, what the Bible teaches. But even for those who are not infected with that kind of dualism, they still want to take very seriously the language of destruction by fire that we have in Second Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Second Peter 2, uh, chapter 3, verse 10. Surely, they argue, this picture of the day of the Lord given here portrays a final destruction, not 
the redemption of creation. However, we do need to see the context in that chapter and to see Peter's whole argument. Peter is arguing against those who scoff at the idea of a coming future judgment. They complacently believe that everything's just going to go on as it always has forever. That's there in verses 3 and 4. But what they forget, says Peter, is that such an attitude was around before the flood. But God did intervene and act in judgment. And so he says, God will assuredly and finally do in the future what he has already prefigured in the past. What he did then by water, he will do in the end by fire. Now, the key thing to observe here is that this language of destruction of the world is used for both events. It's a parallel point in verses 6 and 7. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. You see, what was destroyed in the flood? Not the whole planet or the whole of creation itself, but the ungodly human society on the earth at that time, the destruction of the ungodly, as Peter puts it. So this apocalyptic language of fire in the second part of the chapter then should be understood, I believe, in its biblical sense of purging, cleansing judgment, as the language of water is used in the first part of the chapter. The universe will be purged of all that is evil, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Laid bare, that is, to the all-seeing eyes of our Creator and our Judge. And after that fiery cleansing, after the destruction of the world in the sense of its sinful rebellion against God, then Peter continues with that wonderful verse 13, that in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So the future then is not one of obliteration and evacuation, but of restoration and righteousness. But how will all this be accomplished? Well, in fact, it already has been. We may not be able to imagine with our finite brains what the whole new creation will be like or how God will do it. But Paul assures us that it is already guaranteed that it has been accomplished in anticipation through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For the Bible teaches us, thirdly, that it will not only be us human beings, but rather the whole creation that will be, thirdly, reconciled to God through the cross and resurrection of Christ. I think that Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 23 must be one of the most breathtaking passages that Paul ever wrote about Jesus Christ. He paints in truly cosmic colors and dimensions. Five times he uses the phrase all things, ta panta in Greek. And Paul makes it very clear by adding repeatedly the other words in heaven and on earth and under the earth. It's clear that he means the whole of creation at every possible level. And he tells us that this whole creation has been created by Christ and for Christ, is sustained in existence by Christ, and has been reconciled to God by Christ, specifically by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And that last phrase is very important. We need to lift up our eyes and see the truly cosmic scope of Christ's death on the cross. Paul tells us, through the cross, God has accomplished the reconciliation of creation. And it's within that context that Paul then goes on to say, oh, and you also, he adds in verse 21. You see, we, we tend, don't we, to present the gospel, which is what Paul's talking about here, the other way around. We usually start at the personal level. Christ died to atone for our sins and grant us eternal life, and you can have that if you confess and repent and turn to him. Wonderfully true, praise God. And then we may go on to the ecclesial level. All of us who are redeemed by Christ, well, we're part of the church, the people of God. So it's the body of Christ. You'd better get to belong to a church. And then just possibly we might go on to the rest of creation because we have to live here on earth and do our work and so on until Christ returns somehow to take us home or whatever. But in this text, Paul moves in exactly the opposite direction. He starts with Christ's cosmic creation lordship of all creation, which incidentally is also where Jesus himself started 
in the Great Commission. Do you remember? All authority in heaven and earth, he says, is given to me, the creation, cosmic lordship of Christ. And then Paul moves on to speak about the church, of which Christ is the head. Then he returns to the redemption of all creation through the cross. And finally, he comes to the individual believers who have heard this gospel and responded in faith. It's as if he's saying, look, you believers in Colossae, you get to be part of this great story of cosmic creation and reconciliation when you came to believe this gospel, as he calls it, this good news for all creation, this biblical gospel that includes creation within the redeeming, saving, reconciling plan of God accomplished through the death and resurrection of Christ. And that leads us finally then to our last point. What is our final destination? It is amazing and I think regrettable just how many Christians believe that the world ends with us all leaving the earth behind and going up somewhere to heaven to live there instead. And I'm sure that that's due to the influence of countless hymns and songs that unfortunately use that precise kind of imagery of us going up or going home or going to our eternal rest or whatever other language is used. But that idea of us going up and leaving the earth is decidedly not how the Bible ends. Now, of course, don't get me wrong, there is a very important truth that gives great comfort and hope that when believers die in faith and in Christ, they go to be with Christ, safe and secure and at rest, free from all the perils and suffering of this earthly life. But the Bible also makes it clear that that intermediate state, as it's sometimes called, is just that, intermediate. It's not our final destination to stay in heaven. The Bible's great final dynamic movement in Revelation 21 and 22 is not of us all going up to heaven, but of God coming down here, bringing the city of God, establishing the reunification of heaven and earth as his dwelling place with us forever. If you read Revelation chapter 21 verses 4, 1 to 5, notice the three times that this loud voice from the throne of God says, with mankind, with them, with them, God with us, which of course is what Emmanuel means. Emmanuel is not us with God, but God with us. We don't go somewhere else to be with God. God comes to the earth to be with us as the psalmists and the prophets had prayed for and longed for. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, said Isaiah. And in that new creation, with a God dwelling at last in the cleansed temple of his whole creation. So that's why there was no need for a microcosmic temple, as John saw. The tribute of the nations will be brought into the city of God, the glory of kings purged, purified, and contributing to the glory of God in verses 22 to 27. So let me conclude. And let me begin my conclusion with some further words from the Cape Town commitment in that same part that I read before, part one, section seven. Here's what we read. The earth is created, sustained, and redeemed by Christ. So we cannot claim to love God while abusing what belongs to Christ by right of creation, redemption, and inheritance. So we, and it means we as Christians, we care for the earth and responsibly use its abundant resources, not according to the rationale of the secular world, but for the Lord's sake. If Jesus is Lord of all the earth, then we cannot separate our relationship to Christ from how we act in relation to the earth. But to proclaim the gospel that says Jesus is Lord, which is the very essence of the gospel, is to proclaim the gospel that includes the earth, since Christ's lordship is over all creation. Creation care is thus a gospel issue within the lordship of Christ. So what does all this mean then for our ecological thinking and action in the here and now? Well, I think that it means that in our godly use of and care for the creation, we are doing two things at the same time. On the one hand, we are exercising the created role that God gave us from the beginning. And as we do so, we are properly glorifying God in all our work within and for creation. And on the other hand, we are anticipating the role that we shall have in the new creation, 
when we shall then assume fully our proper role of kings and priests, exercising the loving rule of God over the rest of creation and serving it on God's behalf in the place of God's temple dwelling. In other words, ecological action now is both a creational responsibility from the Bible's beginning and also an eschatological sign of the Bible's ending or its new beginning. Christian ecological action points towards and anticipates the restoration of our proper status and function in creation. It is to behave as we were originally created to and as we shall one day be redeemed for. And the earth is waiting, as Paul says, with eager longing for the revealing of its appointed kings and priests, redeemed humanity, glorifying God in the temple of his renewed creation under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris, for that wonderful lecture, uh, full of the word of God and undoubtedly glorifying to his name. We now have a period of about 30 or 35 minutes for discussion. I'd invite all of you to uh, participate through the Q&A box, as you can see a link on the uh, bottom of your Zoom platform, uh, or view others' questions and mark them, um, mark them up. Uh, we're also delighted to have with us uh, throughout this uh, entire calendar year, or academic calendar year, uh, all of our participants for the, for the lecture series this year. So if I can invite the other speakers to join us as well as to un unmute their microphones, let me uh, briefly introduce each of them. Uh, we have joining us today, Christian Miller, who is the A.C. Reed Professor of Philosophy at Wake Forest University, Max Lee, Professor of New, to New Testament at North Park Theolo Theological Seminary, Paul Neveleski, Assistant Director and, and a Fellow at the Institute for Advanced, Culture, uh, Advanced Studies and Culture. Uh, Oliver O'Donovan was also scheduled to be with us, but he's uh, home where he's been sick for the past week. So please do uh, keep him in your prayers. Gentlemen, thank you for, for being with us. Uh, I should also just recall to the audience that um, this conversation is about um, Chris's talk today, but we're also grateful to have you as part of a year-long conversation as we think about what it means to, um, to believe and confess and live consistently with uh, God's own affirmation in the words of uh, Genesis 1 and as Chris has shown us today throughout the whole of scripture, uh, that he created it good and that we should respond accordingly. So there's questions already rolling in from our participants. Uh, I'd be happy to fill in a space with a question, but why don't I just pause for a moment and see if any of you would, would like to kick off the conversation. I have a question. Uh, Chris, uh, first, thank you for this wonderful talk. I was really encouraged by it and uh, it's helped answer some of my own questions uh, in, this, in this area. I, I have a, you know, a lot of this talk, it seems to me, you're, you're dispelling worries and doubts that um, Christians might have, uh, you know, when you think of, when we think about the neglect of, of care of creation in, in recent memory, and perhaps the lack of focus from, from the church on these issues. And, and I see your talk is helping push back against that tendency. But one lingering doubt that I still have that others might share is, uh, yes, everything you say seems right. Um, you provide many instances of scripture um, revealing God's um, care for creation, the fact that creation is good, that we are meant to be stewards of it as, as kings and stewards. But uh, nevertheless, it seems, it does seem marginal in terms of, you know, sort of airplay that's given within scripture. You know, I, I, the, the, the passages, passages you cite here might be all of them. Now, maybe, you know, if they're not all of them, they at least seem close. But, uh, you know, there's 2,000 other pages that seem to focus mostly on other matters. So I wonder if you might address, and to the broader panel um, could ch chime in as well, wh what should we make of this relative neglect um, of airtime or a focus of scripture overall, even though there are isolated, clear instances revealing God's care and the goodness of creation? 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Paul. I, I'll, I'll respond very briefly and, and then leave it to the others. Yeah, obviously, in the course of the lecture, I couldn't quote very many texts. There, there are a lot more. Uh, I mean, there's actually a lot in, in a prophet like Isaiah on, on creation. Um, there's, there's considerable interest uh, in creation, of course, throughout the Psalms. Um, Job is there with the marvelous creational stuff that you get in, in God's speeches to Job at the end, and where he simply, you know, has like a Niagara Falls of creational stuff there in, at the end of the book of Job. And the fact that uh, in the New Testament, the, the Apostle Paul does include, you know, creation in his theology of redemption. So it's, it's hard to think of a chapter like Romans 8 and what it says, or Ephesians 1 or Colossians 1 as in any sense marginal to Paul's thinking. Um, it does seem to be very much you know, there in the forefront. And I grant you, of course, that the, the big emphasis throughout the scriptures is on humanity, on the need for all nations to receive God's blessing, the promise to Abraham, the role of Israel and that purpose for the redemption of humanity, uh, the Lamb of God who bears away the sins of the world and so on. The redemptive story is primarily a story, yes, of the redemption that God has offered in the human race. But it seems to me that it is very strongly set inextricably set within God's purposes for creation as a whole, hence why where the Bible begins and ends. So, yeah, one would have to point to one or two other books on the subject that, that try and deal with the creational material a bit more fully than that. But I leave it maybe to others. I see, I see Max nodding his head, so maybe he's agreeing with me. Um, yeah, very much so. Um, I would say that um, airtime is one way to talk about the saliency and prominency of important themes in, in the Bible corpus, but sometimes the contextual discussion, uh, the prominence that an individual author of the canon uh, might give uh, in the framework of their document or, or writing actually gives, even though it's not mentioned, there's, not a, there's a large frequently, frequency hit list, it brings prominence to the discussion because of the way it's contextualized. So um, I think creation is at least set in, uh, in the doctrine of God that, for example, in Revelations 4 through 5, um, the two big biblical themes is God is creator and God is redeemer. So Revelations 4 focuses on God as creator. And it's a major theme that's repeated throughout Revelation. And then that God as redeemer is, is mentioned in Revelations 5. And those two uh, twin uh, claims about God's character and identity kind of run through not just, I think, the book of Revelation, but from Genesis all the way to the end of the canon. And I would echo that... Um, Creation's uh, redemption in Romans is a key theme. Um, if we talk about the righteousness of God, that's a major theme that runs through. And righteousness of God culminates in God not putting just humanity right in relationship to him, but all of creation right in relation to him. So I, I do think creation is a, is a prominent theme that um, maybe in the history of its reception is neglected, but it's certainly not neglected by a biblical corpus. What are the, just one brief um, clarification. So I, I, I think you're both right. I agree that it's definitely present and it is given um, a prominent place in overall contextualization and, and in Revelation as well at the restoration of all things, you know, sort of the, the eschatological vision. But, you know, again, for, just from memory, and I for, perhaps are, am forgetting important um, passages, you know, when God comes to earth as a man and talks to us face to face, there's very little discussion of this issue. And um, I think there, I can think of some good potential responses to this, but still I, I think it might, it just sits uneasily with some, with some Christian readers thinking, yes, we do have these passages that point to the importance and there is this overall framing that shows we can't, we can't neglect it. And yet when God came to us as a human, it seemed to feature almost not at all uh, in what he had to say to us. What, why might that be? Well, I, I would, yeah, perhaps he's not talking about it in the kind of terms uh, that we might want to discuss it, but he does come preaching the gospel of the reign of God, the kingdom of God, and in terms of how that term or that concept would have been understood by those who knew their scriptures, which of course meant everybody he was talking to, um, from the synagogue, regular singing of the Psalms and, and the, uh, the, what, God, what would happen when God would bring his kingship certainly included you know the, the the whole of creation rejoicing when God would become king and, and come and judge the earth so it, it wouldn't be quite so far from the thinking of of, of people in that day that uh, the kingdom of God will do something for creation as well as do something for people 
And mm. I think that's, that's where I would locate it within the teaching of Jesus. Of course, he does yes, make use of nature quite a lot in his parables. Um, there's a very, you know, not even a sparrow falls to earth without your heavenly father. That's an incredible statement <laughs> when Jesus says that. Most of our translations say without, uh, without your heavenly father knowing or seeing or something, but he just says not even a sparrow falls to the earth without your heavenly father. So that Jesus has a, has a strong understanding, I think, of creation. And I would link the redemptive element to the kingdom of God texts. Oh, would you be willing to just clarify me for me, if not for everyone else, what, what is the specific issue that you think is um, maybe being disproportionately emphasized? Is it, is it concern for creation per se? Uh, in which case something like the spar sparrows uh, would be a, a counter example. Or is it, are you pressing more specifically on say like a, an ecological focus on Christian ethics? So what, what is the issue that you think is, is getting disproportionate airtime? Uh, I'm not sure any of it is getting disproportionate airtime. I, I think, I, I think that Chris is definitely, you know, certainly right that there's there's excellent support biblically for our ecological concern, um, stemming from the goodness of creation and all the and all the points that he made. But uh, it, it troubles me, you know, as a Christian reader of Scripture, that um, while there are references to creation, as Chris pointed out in the parables that Christ uh, gave, um, you know, in the, in the explicit injunctions that God gives to human beings throughout scripture. And when Christ came to earth, um, there's just very, very little related to care for the earth. Uh, and it, I think I read another paper of Chris's that was also very helpful. And he, at one point said something like, well, um, the people that day were not <laughs> despoiling and instrumentalizing the earth, you know, in quite the same way that we are now. So it could just be a matter of, well, it wasn't a relevant topic at the time. And I, I'm very open to that, but um, the, the, the ethical emphasis of scripture seems much more about, especially in, in Christ's teaching, um, individual ethics relating to other people, uh, which is compatible with care for the earth. But again, the, there's just not the emphasis that I, I wish there was, that, that seems impious, but I wish there was more emphasis across scripture as a whole on care for the earth. Yeah, so do I. I, I mean, it, it'd be nice if it was there. I mean, I think the, the, the corporate or community element of the ethic of, of the New Testament is still also very strong. Clearly, it's, it's uh, individual, it has to behave like that. But Paul is right into churches and communities. Jesus is talking about the, you know, the people within the kingdom of God. Um, there's also an element as well as saying it, it, was, it would not have been such a, an urgent issue as it is today, although not, not that they weren't destroying the earth in some ways. I mean, the Romans certainly destroyed an awful lot of trees and, um, you know, and, and destroyed things in order to feed themselves. Um, but also, um, we don't need to have everything that is commanded by God in the Old Testament scriptures repeated in the New for them to retain some sense of a, of a moral imperative. Right. Um, you know, I think that we could probably find other aspects of, of Old Testament ethics uh, which we would still feel have relevance to us as Christians today, which are not necessarily simply taken up and, and as it were, reissued or remandated in the New Testament. And so if, if you know, one might assume that if, if what it means to be within the kingdom of God is to become a, a kind of new humanity, a kainos anthropos, as Paul puts it, that this has to include an element of living as we were created to do, that we should be doing and being and doing what God intended us to do as, as his uh, creatures made in his image and so on. Um, and that that would have included godly living in relation to the non-human creation. Um, yeah. I could interject a question from the audience that's been um, well received and I think related to this question. Uh, one uh, listener asked, uh, you made a nice case for uh, scripture's ethic as it relates to ecology. Um, does scripture also provide complementary examples of people of God tending towards nature in their own historical context? from which we might gain some uh, practical points of application for our present context. I do, maybe that's also pressing on um, some of Paul's questions is in, in the sense of the motivation for Christian, Christian ethics. So for example, um, are our ecological concerns bound up with um, some kind of nature worship or some love for nature itself? I think you, you do pick up on that topic in uh, the chap similar chapter, The Mission of God, but what is the motivation? And I think your lecture talks on it too, but what's the motivation that drives a, um, a Christian ecological concern? 
And yes. how is it, say, distinct from a kind of Gaia or uh, nature worship? Yeah, I think I, I do try to be very clear in my writing on this that we're not talking about Gaia or nature worship in any sense. Um, and I'm not quite sure whether the question of uh, Eric Kim means, you know, by tending towards nature, tending towards that kind of naturalistic um, approach, which I would uh, eschew. But if what he means and what you were saying is that there is a motivation which is partly obedience, that is simply we should be caring for the earth because God told us to, um, and partly because it's God's property. And if you love somebody, you don't trash their property. You, you care for the property of, of somebody you love. So, you know, if, if the first and greatest commandment is to love God and then love your neighbor as yourself, that has to include loving what belongs to God and loving what contributes to your neighbor's well-being. So there is an, a, an imperative element to it. But I'm sure there is also uh, an emotional, affective element of the love of creation. I mean, there's, I know it can end up being very romantic um, and very, you know, in that non-Christian sense, but there is nothing wrong with appreciating, loving, and enjoying the beauty of creation, the glory of creation, while also respecting and realizing, of course, as one of the other questioners has put, that there's a lot of stuff within the creation, as we know, uh, which behaves in pretty nasty ways, and, and that really is pretty horrible. And I, we might want to come to that in a minute. Um, but it does seem to me that there's every reason to want to care for creation because it is good for us to do so, because you know, there is a, a healing, um, there is a therapeutic, there is a blessing element uh, of simply rejoicing in the, in the natural order of things. Uh, the Psalms seem to be doing that. And I, I, I think there's, that, that's, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that, about being a lover of nature, provided it doesn't move over into uh, the worship of nature. But as a motivation for caring for the earth, it, it has its place. Um, as does compassion and as justice. You know, I... I, I, working with Arosha as I, you know, as part of their team, I'm always amazed at the compassionate nature of the way some of their staff do their work with, you know, with little birds and everything. There's a, there's a tenderness and a love for the voiceless, vulnerable little creatures that they handle, and equally a, a, a concern for justice. That if these habitats are destroyed and and creatures are wiped out, it is unfair. It is unjust. It is it is it is not good. And so there is a, there is a moral imperative which reflects something of the compassion and justice of God, in relation to the created order as well as to the human order. Of course, we we behave with compassion and justice to our fellow humans. We should, and I think something of the same should apply to the earth. Um, I'm. In, as a follow-up to that question, um, and I pre actually prepared four questions based on your paper. I'm not going to get to all of them, but the one that's least developed is the one I'm going to ask because it's relationship to what um, Chris just shared. So let me, um, I want to ask about the word property. Creation is God's property. I'm just wondering if we could rephrase that a little bit because I'm not concerned about your, so much your interpretation of the text as much as how it might be received by hearers and readers, that language, because property evokes modern contexts of, of private ownership and its exploitation. Um, and usually we in, we're not an agrarian society anymore. We're kind of post-industrial technological. So usually when people think of property, they think of inanimate, non-living objects, but creation is living. So I'm just wondering if, could we talk about how we belong to God uh, and and creation belongs to God, but not use the word property, which seems to evoke inanimate inanimate objects or non living things. So that mm -hmm. I feel like human beings by nature might care for something more living than they would something that's, you know, yeah. a, a, a piece of paper they throw away or 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 or, or a rock. Yeah. Um, sure. So I'm I just kind of, yeah, I'm just kind of wondering yeah. if we could talk about that a little bit more. I do get the point, uh, yeah. and, and you're, you're probably right. Okay. Um, and it, there is a sense in which talking about, you know, the earth as God's property is a little bit of shock value. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, okay. it's, it's just trying to, in a sense, make a point that, um, it, you know, the earth is the Lord's. The, yeah. the Hebrew is very clear. You know, mm. it uses the possessive ways of expressing ownership and belongingness. Mm. Uh, the earth belongs to the Lord. Uh, the land is mine, says God in Leviticus 25, 23. You know, to me is the earth, to me belongs the earth. It uses almost the same way that French uses the uh, the, the two form for belonging. Mm. And yeah, 
I mean, would I say that I am God's property? Well, no, probably I wouldn't, but I very happily sing the hymn, you know, uh, uh, I am his and he is mine. Mm. You know, that possessive belongingness relationship uh, between um, persons and God, mm. uh, that we belong to him by his right of redemption. Um, I think what I'm trying to do by that is to say that there is a, a very powerful Christian ethic which needs to be injected into the modern, and I mean that in the technical sense, modern assumption that the earth is purely an object that we can use, objectify and exploit as we wish. Mm. Whereas in a more pre-modern era, I think there was an awareness that the earth had some degree of sac sacredness uh, because it belonged to God. Um, and, and could be examined and used and explored and everything else, but it, it wasn't just ours to exploit. Um, and, and sadly, that element of the earth being just our property, we just, it's just stuff that we can use, yeah. um, is certainly what I'm trying to imply by saying it's God's property, but I am trying to shift the pendulum over to saying we are the guests here. We are the ones who are living uh, as the beneficiaries uh, of what ultimately belongs to God. I mean, in, in a sense... You know, it's, it's like a, a somewhat like a landlord-tenant relationship. Your relationship with a landlord is not impersonal, and it might be, but if you know the landlord, you realize that you, how you treat what belongs to the, your landlord reflects what you think of him. If you go about messing up his property, you don't think much of him, and you'd be in trouble. Um, but if you love him and respect him as a Christian sister or brother, then you will be grateful for what he's made available. You'll pay your rent, you'll do yourself and look after the place. And, and there's something about that, I think, in God's relationship to the earth, Yahweh's relationship to the land, and Israel's relationship to the land, and thereby our relationship to the earth. So it's, it is a possessive relationship that I'm trying to express. And you're probably right to say that just talking about it as God's property may not in the long run be helpful. So maybe you'll find some other way of putting it. I think we th we're thinking on the same page. I mean, I, I acknowledge that we belong to God and creation belongs to God. I, I like the language of belonging because it does evoke a relational element um, more than property but and i'm not afraid of the la word language ownership either but but property just seems to evoke inanimate things and so i was just a little bit that's and it was shocking to read it so you succeeded okay. rhetorically in what you wanted to do the paper all right christian you've been yeah. quiet so chris um i'd like to jump in here so i'm the some of an outsider i'm not a trained theologian i'm sorry if i uh, ask things which are not as uh, well informed as my colleagues here. Uh, but I've certainly learned a great deal from your paper and really uh, found very little I could uh, disagree with. I was hoping you would uh, just say a little bit more about maybe some of the bad sides of creation, if we can, if we can put it that way. And you mm -hmm. already alluded to this uh, a few minutes ago, and it's coming up in some of the questions too. Um, one way to, for me to frame it is um, there wasn't a lot of uh, discussion of the impact of the fall on mm -hmm. creation in your paper. So a lot of what you said seemed to me to be true of pre-fallen pre -fallen world. Um, so post-fall, uh, to what extent is it true that all of creation praises and brings glory to God? Um, to what extent is it true that there are jubilant songs of joy post-fall today, or just to say today? Um, to what extent is it true that, uh, that living creatures are doing what they were created for? Mm. It seems like there are many examples of living creatures not doing what they were created for, uh, mm -hmm. not through any volitional agency of their own, it's just because of the way uh, the, the world is, is, is operating today. Whether mm -hmm. we want to talk about um, harmful mutations, whether we want to talk about viruses, whether we want to talk about uh, other things like that. Um, so maybe could you uh, yeah. intermix some of the bad with the good? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I knew that was coming because one of the other questions was there and I, I, you do get asked it often when you teach on these things. The first thing I'd want to say is um, I think it's important to recognize that when God says the creation is good, that goodness of creation, it is not meaning that it was perfect in the sense that we sometimes use that word good um, as, as a, a golden paradise where nothing was ever um, nothing was ever harmful or that it was in other words the goodness of creation means it was good for the purposes for which god created it and it would need to be subdued and ruled in other words the 
the command to the human race to subdue creation was not an empty thing. And that, that happens before the fall. It's not God says after the fall, oh, oh dear, everything's gone wrong. You'd better now start subduing it. The task of subduing creation and bending it, as it were, uh, to, to uh, God's purposes and ruling over it, which I would say includes all aspects of uh, agriculture as well as other things like uh, the use of herbs, of, of medicines and, and everything else, uh, is there is sort of built into a creation which is which is uh, in that shape having said that also i think the the distinction between pre-human fall and post-human fall in the planet is a difficult one and i don't really want to be dogmatic on it partly because um from any observational point of view in terms of scientific understanding of the planet, uh, whether biological or geological, there is no evidence that things have ever been other than they are now. In, in that sense, there have always been uh, viruses and bacteria and predation, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, and tectonic plate shifting um, and earthquakes and whatnot. The planet, in a sense, has been formed and crafted by God's purposes right through from its emerging to its cooling to the ages of biological eons and so on through till human habitation. Unless one takes a, 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 a young earth creationist point of view that it's only a few thousand years old, which speaking personally, I don't. I, mean, I respect people who have that view, but that's, it's not mine. The challenge therefore is that you would have to say that the fall of, of the human race, which, which must have happened within human historical time. In other words, when human beings were homo sapiens as a species and in the image of God and God conscious and God aware, uh, that at some point that fall of human beings retroactively affected creation backwards across eras of time to uh, produce or to cause things that we no longer like, like rogue viruses and so on. And well, you could hold that, and it's not impossible, but I think it feels very unlikely um, that, that our, the fall has certainly affected our relationship with the earth. It has produced God's curse on, on the soil. It has created, uh, in a sense, the world fights back. But I don't think that we can attribute to the fall all those aspects of creation which we don't like, whether geological or indeed biological. One um, book that I did find quite helpful on this is this one by John Lennox. Uh, where is God in a coronavirus world? It's quite a slim book. He is a, a scientist. He is an Oxford professor of mathematics, and he's, he's quite a good apologist for the Christian faith. He, he happens to make the point, you know, that there are millions upon millions of viruses, and only a tiny percentage of them are dangerous to us. There are billions of bacteria, and a tiny percentage are dangerous to us. That, in a sense, it is almost more amazing that the world is so favorable to us than that there are aspects of it which create pain and sickness and so on, both for animals and for ourselves. So one of the other questions, you know, talks about, you know, the viruses and the bacteria, the things that cause malaria and illnesses and so on. And to, to be honest, I have to say, I don't know why they are there, but someone asked the question, did God create them? And I think the only conceivable answer to that has to be yes, uh, because God is the creator of all that exists. The, these things, you know, are not there from some alien force that comes out of some other universe. You know, um, the, the creation is God's creation. Um, and so we have to theologize around that fact of the creation of God, including these elements, uh, and then build them into our, both our theology and our eschatology, that we do believe there will come a time in the new creation when these things will not be there. Um, so I, I, I recommend that one um, by, by um, John Lennox. Uh, there's also, I think, quite a good one by Tom Wright uh, on God and the pandemic, um, which again has some useful perspectives uh, in there. Um, and, uh, and even by um, Walter Brueggemann, uh, virus as a summons to faith. Uh, Walter Brueggemann being an, uh, an Old Testament um, professor who many of us will know about biblical reflections in a time of loss and anxiety and grief. So these are more pandemic related than creation care related, but I, I find them helpful. They're all small enough to read over one weekend, as I did once. Thank you. There's a lot more to say, but I'll turn back to Jeff, because I'm sure he wants yeah, to Yeah, the big that. issue, and I don't yeah, have final yeah. answers. And I'm not a biologist or a scientist. I'm only a humble theologian. <laughs> Can I ask a follow-up um, 
to, to Chris's response. Uh, Chris, I'm just curious about, your, you know, you were saying you don't see how to get around the issue that, well, God, God must have made, you know, coronavirus and, and the other, you know, harmful to humans, bacteria and viruses, because where else could they have come from? Um, just want to get your, your hot take on a, on a somewhat speculative hypothesis. Um, some people have, have suggested that God included uh, his, his divine counsel in the creation of, of the world. Um, I've seen interpretations of the passage, you know, let us make man in our image uh, as being God is speaking to other members of the council. Um, and if that's, if that's plausible, then perhaps God was incorporating these angels or these, these um, other, other members of the, of the divine council uh, in his creation of the rest of the created order, sort of permitting angels to engage in sub-creation. If that's the sort of thing that some members of the divine council have in their powers, then is there a, is there a pretty easy way to rule out the possibility that um, whenever the you know after whenever the angelic fall occurred, some of the angels misused these these powers for subcreation? You know, uh, can we rule out the possibility that these were the result of that sort of abuse? Yeah, thanks, Paul. I I, I do find that difficult. Um, I, I realized from another email I've had recently that there's a whole thing about the, the divine council going on and I, I haven't been part of um, the awareness of that. Of course, yes, when God says let us, it is a plural uh, and it is perfectly possible that he is in that sense speaking to the angelic hosts that surround his throne. Um, some people think it's more likely that it's simply the plural of, of divine majesty, um, you know, um, as um, kings and queens are tend to speak in the we form. Um, it may be a purely that sort of a plural. I'm, I'm a little bit more inclined to that, but I'm equally open. Of course, we have to believe that there is, there is this heavenly host. There is this awareness. It's there in the book of Job. It's in Isaiah and elsewhere. But I'm not convinced that there would be any biblical support for the view that angelic creatures who are themselves creatures um, play any part in the creation as such. Um, I, I'm not sure where I would find biblical support for that. In other words, that they were busy creating stuff somewhere other than what God was doing, or they were playing around in the sandbox, as it were, themselves. And then when they fell, they began to do nasty things. Um, it, it seems to me that the Bible is much more emphatic that there is only one God transcendent, you know, the Richard Borkham uh, point, only God inhabits that transcendent category of Godness, and only the living creator God is the God who created all things. Um, it's also worth pointing out, though, that we as human beings have the capacity to to mess up creation as God has created it. So, you know, for example, yes, these viruses like these zoonotic ones, like the coronavirus that come from animals and get into humans, they've only in a sense started coming out of animals and getting into humans when we as humans have started, you know, invading their space and, and destroying their habitat and getting you know, closer to the wild than, uh, than perhaps God intended us. It's, there is an element of folly, if not of sin, certainly elements of folly uh, in the way in which natural things or things that happen both in the biological sphere and the geological sphere affect us badly as humans. We know that sin amplifies the effects of earthquakes and tsunamis enormously. Um, and depending on all sorts of injustice. And sin and folly certainly amplify the effects of, of things like the coronavirus. Um, now that's, that's not to sort of excuse, let God off the hook. It, it's simply to say that you know, if, if we behave in those ways and don't listen to creation when it's sort of fighting back against us, then there comes a point when we, we eat the fruit of our own folly, which is what High Proverbs 1 describes it, that if you won't listen to God's wisdom, they will eat the fruit of their folly which is a very powerful piece of, um, of warning to us there, I think, uh, in that passage. 